the world is a different place. Uh, but we have the opportunity and the uh, ability to change those things. But it starts with us. And if we can get off those Ferris wheels that we can create for ourselves, or if we can start to heal ourselves of those things and recognize the incredible people and individuals that we are, every single one of us has the ability to do something that will massively change and help somebody else or ourselves. We have abilities to be able to do things and be people that are unique. Nobody else could do the job that we do for somebody else or for ourselves. Insight and Awareness Spiritual Explorer. Soul Intuitive, Emotional and Spiritual Mentor and award-winning author, Lorraine Nylon. Welcome, Explorers. Today we have a special guest and he's been one of our podcast guests before and it's Kieran Morgan and he's been part of a collaborative author's book and it's called The Energy Healer's Oracle and I think there's about 20 authors involved but today he wants to talk about energy and he's going to explain some things that we might not understand so thank you for being here Kieran. And Kieran, can you tell our listeners what you've been up to? So, because you've had a few adventures of late. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Lorraine. It's lovely to be back, and thanks for um, for making the space and the time for me to be back on. My pleasure. Kind of a kind of a lot has happened for me uh, personally and energetically as well. So, personally, my wife and I we just moved down to um, a little town just outside Glastonbury. In, uh, in southern England, so we're next to the heart chakra of the world now, which is uh, a really beautiful place to be. Uh, lots of like-minded people, so I can have conversations with people when they ask how I am. You know, when you're out in the, in the real world with with um, the supposedly normal people, you just have to smile and go, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, okay, yeah, oh, the weather's going to be a bit rainy today. But actually, what I want to say is, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm really struggling because Mercury's retrograde and Pluto's in this part of my house, and I really can't focus on anything at all and there's a huge download of energy because there's a new moon and I'm, I'm really struggling with that. Um, so was that your in, purpose of moving to that area? Yeah, it's part of that and part of, um, uh, there's some logistics as well because my wife's family uh, is where we used to live, much closer and now we're kind of sort of halfway between the two, my family and my wife. So we get to spend, I get to spend a bit more time with them, which is lovely. But being there, and, and there's a bit of an exodus as well from, from people to Glastonbury. There's always this migration of people that want to go and they spend a couple of weeks there and then they leave. But with the, the shift of our sort of um, humanity's energy trying to shift into the, to the 5D world, there's a new batch of people going to Glastonbury now and settling down and trying to, to sort of establish themselves there and do new things and, um, it's an inter really interesting time. There's lots of need for people to be there to help um, transform and, and alchemize the energy because most people go to Glastonbury uh, because it's like kind of a pilgrimage for them and they're feeling that they need something or they want to release something and they go up to the tour or the ch uh, beautiful chalice um, well and they dump all their emotional baggage and their energy and they skip down the hill happy as Larry and then there's just a big, huge miasma of negative energy that spirals and swirls around Glastonbury that the locals have to deal with. So, um, so, so is that is that an ancient tradition to go up to the well and and drop your negativity? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a beautiful wellhead which is in the shape of a vesica Pisces, so the intersecting circles. And um, people have traditionally that you go there and it's very much connected with the divine feminine energy and you sit, meditate and people drop um, crystals or jewelry or, and I've done it myself uh, with times for release. And then the waters just cleanse and clear, they help to release. Up on the tour as well, it's the highest point there, the, the home of ancient Avalon and the priestesses of Avalon and the home of magic and Morgan the Fay and things like that. So people go there to find themselves or to release their old selves if they're breaking away from the material world and they want to um, sort of be reborn, you know, and, and, and re-establish themselves or release and let go. Uh, and you said, you said about changing to a 5D world. So can yeah. you give a short 
explanation of what that is for our listeners? Well, in my understanding, uh, it, it is an expansion of our consciousness and our hearts mostly. So in the world in which we uh, humanity has evolved up until the last 15, 20 years, uh, probably a little bit longer than that, maybe if you went back to the sort of 50s and 60s, it was a commercial world, you know, it, we were judged on our material gains, you know, the, the car you drive, the house you have, the the money you have in the bank. And that's the 3D world, that is, you know, Minecraft world, if you like, of just creating and building, and this is what we have, this is how you judge me. And there's that breakout in the 60s, obviously, with the peace and love movement and uh, an expansion of heart consciousness. And it, it kind of railed for a while and then sort of dipped back down underneath this tidal wave of consumerism, which has been rife. And the, now we're moving into a space of, um, I, this is my belief, is that humanity really has to open its heart up. Otherwise, humanity, we talk about this global catastrophe, um, the extinction, rebellion, people, and that type of thing, talking about the, the catastrophe for Mother Earth, about this um, existential crisis for humanity. But I think if people don't open their hearts up to the reality, then humanity is going to suffer and to, to ultimately fail. And it's not necessarily for the everyday people, because everyday people understand that, they know that this is the big businesses, the corporations, the the big wheels that turn that are still so focused on money and success, even though we're running out of resources left, right and centre and our uh, poor, beloved planet well, is going a bit bonkers. Yeah, the they're making they're profit the at the expense of the people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and if you look at our um, lockdowns and the whole coronavirus thing, billions and billions, the rich people got richer. And yeah. the, the poor people, I mean, over here in the UK, the poor people are standing on their doorsteps on a Thursday night, banging pots and pans, saying, thank you, NHS, our, our health service will looking after us. And now they want to, they're basically trying to cut the NHS up into little pieces and sell it to the highest bidder. Um, and so this greed, instead of this um, idea of it will sort of calming down and love and harmony, let's work together to defeat the virus and to look after the people at the end of your road or street or where you are people have become incredibly selfish. Mm. And it's the last strands of this expansion into a higher form of consciousness where we have to open our hearts up to to love and compassion and understanding and acceptance. Um, Do you think that humanity, well, my reference to humanity is souls in a physical body, but they realise they're souls in a physical body. And then I refer to mankind as a collective energy that forget their souls in a physical body. Uh, so, so I, it, when in my writing, I have a distinguish between the two. Distinguish mm. between the two. Do you think that sometimes us as mankind have to take ourselves basically to the brink before we actually wake up and get really honest about what we're creating and what we're doing to our host? You know, without mm. the host, we're not here. Um, do Do you think that's what we're part of at the moment? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, as you may remember, I'm a big um, computer geek and a, and, a, and a nerd when it comes to comic book films and and TV and that type of thing. And when you look at this part of, of many stories of, of superheroes is they get to a point of complete crisis where they're, everything is just about to fall apart and they, they don't know who they are or why they're doing what they're doing. Um, that could be Spider-Man, that could be Superman, that could be Batman. But it could also be um, the, Jesus Christ, it could be the Buddha, it could be others. You know, they've had that time of complete and utter destruction. And then the realisation and, the, and the revelation has expanded from that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I know that people will may make their eye twitch a little bit, me talking about Jesus and Spider-Man in the same breath. But <laughs> the, the, the similarities are there. Luke Skywalker was another one, you know, getting to that crisis point. But we're, do, we're doing that as a, as a species. And your distinction for humanity and um, and mankind is really interesting as well because I try not to use the word mankind because it puts a male-dominated mm. tag on humanity, on people. But at the same time, it is that male-dominated world which is, uh, in my experience, very much responsible for lots of the troubles that we're in now and have been for quite a long time. So 
those two distinctions that you make make absolute sense to me. Yeah. Um, those, those, those changes. So we are right on that cusp point. And there's many people that will say we just tip on over it and other people say we just come up to it, but we are, we are on that knife edge. Um, but you, there's also that time for incredible expansion and, uh, and revelation, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So if we get to, and I think humanity gets to that crisis point or, or, or mankind does and people do as individuals, you know, it's not until for lots of people, when if you go back, lots of people, it's not until they get to the point where the doctors say, look, if you have another cigarette, that's it, you, you're done. Or if you have another drink, that's it, you're done. Or if you take another whatever, that's it, you're done. Yeah. Where they go, okay, well, I'll, I'll stop doing that then. Or they'll continue to do so and, and, and disrupt. You know? Yeah, and we also do the thing, you know, is and you know, guilty of this myself, is where you go, oh, you know, I know that can happen, but probably won't happen to me. But the reality is, where did you get that belief from? So, and it, depending on where you are in the world at the moment, whether you think we're on the cusp or heading to it, you know, there's plenty of people that are living, you know, hellish lives because of the circumstances around them. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So they're, they're already, they would already be saying, I'm living the deterioration of humanity. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and whether that's... Um... A, a, a physical expression of that, like the wildfires that uh, you guys had or are, are going through Greece at the moment, the temperatures in Europe, mainland Europe at the moment, which is you know, pushing mid 40s um, centigrade, which is, uh, you know, we had, we had the same thing uh, last year in the UK. Or it's the crisis of the um, commercial world and, you know, it, it, global economy is going through the floor and interest rates going through the ceiling and the cost of living crisis and not having enough food and these are all parts of that expansion of consciousness it's all part yeah. of that the, you know the, and i know that there's many sort of belief systems that have that well this is the end of days you know um and yeah maybe maybe it is but the end of something is always the opportunity for the beginning of something else true sure. You know, we, we yeah. get to the end of something and we, we can start something new. So um, it is a huge hope of mine uh, and lots and lots of people that there is still this little um, light of hope in, in the souls of people. Yeah, and I, I, I sort of look at it, this is my personal opinion, is that I can't fix the global problems, but I can actually be try and deal with myself and, and look at it as an evolutionary path. You know, there's one spark within the collective and if there's many sparks within the collective, you get a change within the collective. Mm. And and that if I do my bit, you know, resolve my energy and try to be honest about reality, then, you know, that's the starting point. And, that, and to, to really hold value in taking self-responsibility for my own evolution you know, so yeah. my inner world, and um, and I live by that. That's a bit of my my code. Some days better than others. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all do that. <laughs> yeah, we all yeah we all yeah. do that. And so you know, so but it's like that's sort of fundamentally what I class as as a bit of the code. Yeah. So absolutely. and and you because you've worked with energy for a long time, you know. So could you explain a little bit about your the energy work that you do? And and about the the gateway that you you mentioned before we come on air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Just to circle back to what we were saying, though, um, being the change you want to see in other people is a is a phrase which you, which I, I like. Yeah, um, good phrase. And, and you know, and you have that hundred monkeys scenario as well. You know, if we because one of the big things at the moment uh, that we've had for a, a really long time is that as an individual, you can't change anything. Mm. What's the point of voting? What's the point of putting your know, recycling in the bin? What's the point of, you know, turning the lights off or whatever as an individual? But yeah, and if, and if one, only one person does it, then it doesn't necessarily make a lot of difference. We're not going to save humanity. I'm not going to save humanity by washing out my yogurt pots as an individual. Yeah. But if anybody, everybody on the planet washes out their yogurt pots, or fifty percent of them, or you know, however many it is, or even if we had yogurt pots that were, you know, biodegradable. And we're made of plastic in the first place. Then enough people want that, then that will change, and that's part of what we are. 
Well, I think that's a sad part is that when we we've when the powers of be, the people with the money and the power are making all the decisions about the mass what the mass people are doing, and then if we don't actually say anything or you know express and and sometimes you've got to do that by withdrawing from buying a product yeah. it's like so because they're only money driven so it's kind of you know working out ways to to steer it you know in a sustainable way you know i mean we're recycling but why aren't the companies making the the products that are biodegradable you know like so you know, we're leaving it to the, the people to try and sort out what is actually starting further up the food chain, in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say, because we have lots of protests in the UK uh, at the moment, but uh, and they're protests which are impacting people as individuals, working mm. people or people trying to get to work because people you know, are blocking the roads or they're gluing themselves to the train tracks or whatever. Um and it's yeah, it's to get publicity, but it's for me, it's getting publicity to the wrong people because anyone that's going from the outside of London on a train into London understands and knows that we're in a global crisis. They don't necessarily have the power to change anything. The big mm. companies, the massive, um, huge global companies do have that power, um, but they're not the ones that are listening. So what they're doing with those protests, uh, preaching to the choir which is a, a very lovely thing to do, but all it's doing is really annoying the choir. So we're taking, they're actually taking power and, and, and sympathy away from the global crisis because, you know, John Smith, who's on the train and can't get to work on time and has to get then, you know, do extra work because of the cost of living crisis and his mortgage has gone up by a thousand pounds a month and he's, Mm. Bills have gone up by five hundred pound a month, so he's got to get you know do more work. He can't get to work on time because some muppet's been chucking <laughs> uh, glue all over the place. Yeah, that's not going to get sympathy for a global crisis. It's just going to annoy people, and they're going to have less sympathy for it. Um, so, uh, and then I, their argument is, if they don't do things like that, they can't get any media time. You know, the the biggest problem is that we're not talking about the reality and the people that could make a change easily more easily than what we can have decided you know profit over planet the people whatever yeah. so, so that's the mindset and that it's a complex problem and and you know i'm, I'm not sure what the solution is either you know I mean? it, is, it is a really complex problem and it is global but it's also for me it's also simple if those companies decided people over profit yeah then oh i agree would, i agree with that but getting those companies to do that that's oh, yeah, a complex yeah. problem <laughs> that's a complex problem but it, you know one ceo and, and this is how i see it is it's, it's being simple one ceo finds an expansion of consciousness in the heart finds some compassion realizes that even though they're a multi multi millionaire and they don't need any more money, and they'll go, okay, well, that, you know, I'm set for life. My kids are set for life. My kids' kids are set for life. Everyone's going to be fine. Nobody's going to be running out of uh, jaffa cakes anytime soon. Then um, I don't need to make any more money, and my company doesn't mean need to make five hundred million trillion bazillion dollars profit a year. We can survive on making. 1% of that and we'll still be a very successful company and so um, but then everybody in the world will be able to have clean drinking water so let's do yeah. that or yeah. instead of funding um, trips to go to Mars let's sort out the world's um, healthcare problems and vaccinate people against fundamental diseases or other things like that, let's put that money that way instead of, so it is incredibly complex to get people to do that but um, it's also, I think, you know, a seed change and, and part of the, like we were saying about this big energetic shift and the, um, the big gateway that we had last month, well, last month, it feels like last month, it was only 12 days ago. It's been a real roller coaster for me. So the gateway that came up um, at the beginning of the month was on the 7th of July, which is the 7-7. 
2023 is a seven year as well. If you add the numbers 2023, then that's another seven. So numerologically speaking, there's significant um, dates and things around the year uh, and, and throughout the decades, which are, which are quite interesting. And when connect into those, then there's big opportunities for change. There's a lion's gate, which is on the 8th of the 8th, 8th of August, which is another big one coming up uh, at the beginning of next month. So the seven is important, uh, especially to me, because it's the energy of the violet flame, which is an energy connected with the number seven and the seventh ray. So um, there's a belief system that each number has a different ray associated with it, a different color associated with it, a different okay. energy, and, and a different set of uh, ascended masters' presences or angels and opportunities for transformation and change. So when you're saying a gateway opened, so what, what is a gateway? Why is it important for us to know about it? The gateways are opportunities. Again, I'm going to put my, my um, film geek head on and That's good. talk about like talk about the Dark Crystal film. Okay. So if you remember the Dark Crystal film, so it's a fantasy world. There were two different species and there was this crystal that had been broken and smashed. And these okay. two species were at war with each other for a thousand years. And the whole film was about them having this big convergence of planets. So all of the planets lined up in the sky and there was this one opportunity for the um, chosen one to find this little shard of the dark crystal and put it back in the right place as all of these planets lined up to bring peace and harmony back into their world. And it's all about this um, the opportunity to do that and how um, this young Gelfling, um, who's the, the, the sort of species, uh, Jen, um, tried to do that and had to try and do that, overcoming the evil ones and the most, there was the mystics and the um, Skeksis and they were, but actually when it turns out when they came to this convergence and everything turned out right, turned out that they were part of the same thing. Oh, yeah. The film is very much an allegory about humanity. We have this good side, the, the sort of angels and the devils and the, um, the, the sort of uh, good parts of humanity or mankind and the, the challenging ones. So with these big energy gateways there's an opportunity for lots of seeds to be sown and energy to be poured into these things or drawn from them for transformation and to change on the 777 gateway the the energy of the violet flame is all about transformation and change and alchemy so turning and using energy and recycling it for something else so it's a great opportunity to release negativity and old thought patterns and um, the despair and sadness and fears that we have gathered as a as a collective and use that as energy for fuel for changing things so does it, so if a gateway opens like you know on a, the seventh thing does that does that impact all of us? Do we start noticing our stuff more, or is there a is there an energetic energy that comes across everybody, or how does it work? Yeah. So on those uh, gateways and planetary uh, alignments, and uh, we go through it every month with the phases of the moon. The mm. full moon is great for releasing uh, and, and letting things go as we we go into the the, the waning moon. A new moon is great for manifesting and getting things going because the moon then starts to um, build its uh, to, to wax to build its light. So we have these cycles all the time and throughout the seasons of the year. But the seven seven gateway was a, a, a sort of mass opportunity for this energy of the violet flame to to release things. So being um, I'm very lucky to be a guardian of the uh, earth chakra connected with the violet flame energy. There are earth chakras again around the globe connected with different energies, different consciousnesses. People may well have noticed, um, what, and I certainly did, strange dreams about things from their childhood, traumas, and that could be big things, or it could be, you know, remembering the teacher that told you off once when it wasn't your fault, or, you know, um, tripping over and hurting your knee or, or or really big things, you know, big traumas of relationship breakups or deaths and things like that. And so 
what I found personally was that there was lots of this stuff coming up and lots of things um, and, and being more aware, as you say, I've been doing this stuff for a while now, um, nearly come up 25 years. I'm quite aware of past life things as well. So repeating patterns of things that have happened in past lives. So there was a lot of fear, a lot of tension. We can see that globally as well with the way things are in the world, you know, with our um, tightrope walk with the, the war in Ukraine, mm. which is a, which is for me, is a thinly veiled blanket over World War Three. You know, um, Ukraine has been funded uh, and given weapons and time and energy by everybody else in the world, but they're also not officially saying, well, we're giving you this, but you know, yeah. just going, well, we're just going to leave this over here. Yeah. We're going to step away from it. And if you happen to pick it up, that's great, but we, we don't, you know, then we're actually saying we're fighting Russia. So, um, and it's a, but it's a, it's a scary time. And the. I think you can feel, I, I think everybody's feeling that, that definite uncertainty. Like, mm. where are we heading? What are we doing? You know, how is this working? How have we got to here? Yeah. You know, because everyone's starting to suffer in some form. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so there's that feeling of hopelessness, of insignificance. Um, but this energy gateway is also those thoughts and those feelings and those doubts are energy. So if you take the pure physics of things, mm -hmm. um, a tidal wave doesn't know that it's good or bad. It's just got a lot of energy. And whether, you know, if, if it happens to hit a, a really built up area for humanity, then the, the wave doesn't know that. It's just going, well, I'm just being a wave. I'm yeah. just doing my job. You know, I, the sun, when it hits 50 degrees, doesn't know that it's causing harm to people. It's just, well, I'm just being the sun. I'm just doing my job. Yeah. Um, so this energy there is an opportunity to be, to be harnessed and used as fuel for transformation and change. We can hide and away from it. We can say, no, this is you know, terrible. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. And I'm just going to, you know, shut my door and do nothing. Or we can use it as fuel to change and to move on and express that. Like we were saying, if people have to do things. And if we, if we can just change our world, then that ripples out to the world. This um, energy work that we did on the 7 7 was all around. The violet flame, as I said, transformation and change and alchemy. And the different earth chakras have um, different energies, but you can have the aspect of the violet flame within all of them as we can in ourselves. So if we're suffering a really tough emotional time, we can wallow in that emotional time and sort of spin you know, spin cycle ourselves and just repeat those patterns. Or we can use the energy of those things to go, right, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to move up out of it. That's the energy of the violent flame in the emotional realms. If we overthink, if we are big overthinkers but not doers, then we can actually use that energy to go, right, I'm going to stop thinking about it. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to do something about it. Right. So the violet flame is transformation. Because yeah. I think that's an important point. Even, you know, like, so I don't, I don't. I read energy, but I don't really work with energy. If you know what I mean, I don't mm -hmm. use it as a healing thing. I use understanding. You know, it's the idea is to get the person to understand themselves, mm -hmm. so, which which is what I class as transformational. And what you said there is that you, if you can make a choice to go, I am intentionally going to start transforming this negative energy, this this emotion that I'm stuck in, this history that's you know I'm clinging on to dear life to. Yeah. I can actually transform that into a healed. For me, it's always about understanding it. So you you're actually transforming it into wisdom, mm. and then and then that inner inner wisdom builds your, your um, feeds your soul and becomes part of your soul. And the stronger you make your soul, the 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 more that you work from your soul instead of your unresolved emotions and that's yeah. a, that's a big choice to make yeah so absolutely big, yeah and the, and the first step in that is that remembrance and realization that you have a choice oh absolutely without that you're stuck yeah absolutely. Yeah. But, and you feel powerless and but and people talk all the time in the spiritual world about taking your power back you know and, and embracing yeah. your true self whatever it is and it's a very 
ethereal sort of enigmatic thing to say but it starts with saying i i am an overthinker i'm a piscean okay and i'm a piscean who is a very old soul so if there is anybody on the planet that is better than me than just self-obsessing about a problem <laughs> you reckon you've got the gold star for it? i reckon if it was if there was an olympic <laughs> olympic event in obsessing about self not so not necessarily so much now but Certainly in my teenage years and in my twenties and thirties, I would just sit like a you know when your computer's lagging and it just has that little dial oh, yes. that goes round and round and round. That was me. <laughs> Everything was buffering. My entire life was just one big buffer. Where I like I that can, analogy. And I never did anything. I was crippled yeah. by yeah. past uh, childhood uh, trauma, by fear of getting things wrong, of making mistakes. Ironically, in the job that I used to have teaching, I would teach kids to make, I tell them to make mistakes. Well, if you get it wrong, screw it, it doesn't matter. That's just, you know, just rebuild it, start again and do it better next time. Um, so we, yeah, so you reach that point where you go, right, I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing that. And I'm going to, what I try and do now is go, so look, this is the problem. These are the scenarios. This is a solution. Let's try this solution. If that works, great. And I build myself a little diagram. You know, like a like a computer program diagram. If this happens, go here. If this happens, go here. If this happens, go here. And then when you have the solutions to lots of different scenarios, you go, okay, well, that's that's a plan. So yeah. let's do something. And it, once you break that cycle, it gets easier to do that. You know? Oh, for sure. Actually, throughout uh, the Insight and Awareness book that I've got, I've got pictures of merry-go-rounds. And, and that, that is why, because... Once we jump on the merry-go-round, you know, we can, we're stuck in ruminating. See, ruminating doesn't go anywhere. Self-reflection does, where you get honest with yourself and you're identifying options, you're, you're acknowledging reality, as much as what you can understand at any given point. You know, you're not, not every experience you're going to understand it all at once. And, some, you know, there's some things that I started exploring 20 years ago and I'm just getting answers for them now. You know what I mean? So that so oh, yeah. you've got to sort of trust that you're in the process. But when you're ruminating, you're actually generating the emotional energy up that creates a, basically a wall and holds mm. it all in. So you're only reliving, reliving, reliving. You're not actually ob objectively observing or taking responsibility for your own emotion, you know, mental health and emotional being. Yeah. And that that's a hard choice to make when you are in that ruminating place, you know, because it everything's back feeding the hopelessness and the helplessness and the victimhood and the self pity and the sorrow and the hurt. And it's like a tidal wave. That's in another book. I actually draw them like tidal waves. These emotions can take you out. Just acknowledge the truth of what you're experiencing and you've already altered the merry-go-round. Yeah. You know, like if you just go, okay, I am just going on and on and on about this. It's not going anywhere. That that's enough truth to start slowing down the merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. And um, but what we normally do too is we are invite people to jump on the merry-go-round with us. So we'll go and sit with someone and we'll just regurgitate the story, regurgitate the oh, story. Oh yeah, the pity party. The pity party, yeah. Yeah, and, and then was... we we walk away going, "Oh, that was good," and the person's like, "Oh, I'm completely drained." So. Yeah. Yeah, so, so just acknowledging those parts of how our energy works, you're already in front. Mm. Yeah. And this, this energy of the, the violet flame has an opportunity to do that. Um, there's lots of different aspects. So it's a, it's a connected with the number seven. So it's connected with the seven-pointed star. And there's energetic beings at each point of the star which represent different things. And one of my favorites in that is the Archangel Jeremiah. Jeremiah is all about... Um, he's the angel of the last breath. So I do lots of soul rescue work and I do lots of energetic work as well. And I have carried... Could you could you explain that to our listeners? What does that mean? Which bit? The yeah, energy there's... work? Soul rescue work? Soul rescue, yeah. Soul rescue work. Okay, so um, when people get to the end of their life, um, they're not... The mechanics, that, as, as far as I understand it, the physical body dies. That this energetic part of them, which is a, a sort of part of a an oversoul, 
So I'm going to liken it to a computer. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine a mainframe cloud computer, and we've got a little zip drive like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, this is gets downloaded. The the aspect of ourselves when we're born gets downloaded into our consciousness. It collects all of its memories, stores all the memories. When we get to our end of our life, it's supposed to return back to this mainframe computer, plug it in. It downloads all the memories and experiences. It learns from them. It goes, okay, cool. Well, when you come back next time, here is your homework, and this is the things you need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, when, but when we when, for whatever reason, there's lots and lots of different reasons that when we get to the end of life, um, sometimes that soul can't, that, that part of the soul can't return. So it may be that it gets stuck in an emotional loop. It doesn't want to go back because it's scared. So sometimes that's religious fear. You know, mm -hmm. there's certain um, organized religions that preach if you're not a good person that's had a good life and done perfect things and you're going down there and it's going to be bad. So at the end of life, people have this huge panic attack. Go, well, I'm not going anywhere. You know, if there's supposed to be a door with somebody you think, I'm not, I'm not stranger danger. I'm not going through the door. I'm not yeah. going anywhere. I'm going to stay right here. Or they believe that somebody that they, uh, their loved ones can't cope without them, or they just don't want to go. Or uh, with lots of things, if there's a, uh, a big event, that, so let's say there's a, an explosion or an accident, then there's not enough time for the sort of collective that are looking after people like guardian angels and things like that to be able to see through a fog of, of um, free will of humanity. So if there's somebody with a with a, a vest, an explosive vest, there's this big smog around them because the, nobody knows if they're actually going to do the thing that they say they're going to do. So it creates this big smog. So when it, if it does go off, the, even the angelic presences can't get to them um, before their energy, um, sort of the window closes on their opportunity to return home. If there's lots of electromagnetic smog, for example, uh, here in, in London with the underground, you down, you know, three, four hundred meters surrounded by electromagnetic uh, energy and things like that. So there's just this too much inf uh, interference. It's a little bit like um, the Starship Enterprise not being able to beam up people because there's yeah, too much you. interference. You know, there's, that always happens when, at the worst times. Yeah, yeah. Because so, I wrote about, I wrote about it. So my way of explaining it. Is that, and this is this is from what I've experienced in my read, and it, and it's it's written about in, in lots of ancient cultures as well. Is that when we when we die, most people, I call it crossover. You know, most people go where they're meant to go very easily. It's a natural process of what we're experiencing, and I call it the awakening period. You've got about three days. After you die, there's this awakening energy that's basically looking for you and giving you, you know, the bus ticket off you go sort of thing. And some some souls will elect for all the reasons that you said, and 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 they can be quite, you know, individual reasons that that people souls don't don't cross over. And then that that energy diminishes, but you're never disconnected from your soul unless you go into demonic energy, and that's a bit different again. That's how we end up with ghosts and spirits and 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 stuff. So there's that. So that's what you're you're saying that you help those people that yeah. are, that are trapped yeah. and stuff. So, like and, saying, so when that when that doorway closes, or yeah. even though or the, or the energy gets really thin, so it's like thin. a teeny tiny thing. It's yeah. very difficult for the the higher levels of frequencies, high energies, to get hold of those souls again. Yeah, so, and it's and it's by choice too. Yeah, absolutely. you know, like if you if you you can reject that awakening energy, yeah. you know, like that big channel that's coming down, you you can you know, and that's ge generally that's what's happening, isn't it? Mm. It's it's that most people are rejecting it for whatever reason, misunderstanding, fear, um, all those sort of things. Or you know, some I've had some that didn't know, didn't believe that they were dead and kept fighting yeah. that they yeah. they weren't alive anymore because they could feel themselves. But and then they, you know, they go through this shock period, which mm. you get that in sudden car accidents and things like that that are unexpected. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you you help those souls cross cross over, go home to go back yeah, home. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. To return to the to the divine source, whatever that may be. Yeah. Whether that's the Elysian Fields of the Vikings, whether that's heaven, whether it's you yeah. know what whatever it is, yeah. because we open a. a through meditation and focused energy, we open an energetic portal to help 
you know, like a like a doorway, um, so that we that energy can go through. So it's like reopening a an underground um, station that's been closed, uh, or yeah. opening a Jacob's ladder, which is a return to the divine light. And there's different ways of doing it. Some some aspects of of um, spirituality, they do it one by one. They contact individual souls. They talk about their trauma, why they didn't cross over. And you get through. Mine's very much a fast track. We can open this big, huge portal. Lots of protection, lots of love and energy, and we just come, we just basically energetically chucking this. <laughs> anyone that's ready to go through, <laughs> go through. You know, it's yeah. like a free for all, just off your. And I've seen grab your bus ticket and off you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we started doing it, it was with uh, the focus with was was with warriors from from different um, uh, wars and that type of thing throughout humanity's history, and friends of mine that were there that were uh, clairvoyant that could tune in would see. First of all, well, soldiers carrying Vikings, talking with, uh, wow. you know, different people from different cultures, but they had this camaraderie because they had all fought, fought and died for what they believed in. Yeah. And so there would be this incredible sense of community that they could all, you know, they always had something in common that they were fighting for what they believed in. Whether that turned out, as far as history was concerned, to be right or wrong, it's yeah. what they believed in. Yeah. And they laid down their lives for their family or for their country or for what they believe to be the greater good. So we do this with, without judgment as far as is possible and without um, constraints of time and, uh, and that sort of thing. And it's, a, it's an incredible thing to do, uh, to be able to be um, part of. I'm very grateful for the, for the opportunities to be able to, to do those things because those souls also hold down the... Um, the, the sort of nature of the energy of the planet the, the very low vibration very tired souls very sad souls very fearful and it holds that collective consciousness down and um, so it's part of that transformation and change as well so it's a it's a an interesting process yeah it's definitely mm. interesting and you use um dragon energy don't you yes so f for me working with that and again all of these things are an expression of energy, so I, it makes sense in my head for some reason, and I don't understand why it may be not such a past life thing, is that visualisation, that idea of uh, a big, powerful beast for protection is something that, it, that it is echoed through history of, of um, humanity for thousands and thousands of years. There are symbols in tombs in Mesopotamia uh, and and around there, which are four or five thousand years old, that have symbols that look like dragons carved in them for protection. Um, the sun god Ra, when he goes across the sky and goes into the underworld, is protected by a serpentine or, or dragon-like god called Mehen as he goes into the underworld. You know, so they are they are powerful energies that have been around for a long time. Huge resurgence as well in the last ten years. Mm. I um, I attended a as part of a summit of people that loved dragons so there was over a thousand people there a few weekends ago whereas five years ago you wouldn't get anything like that so it's a real resurgence in that energy because it's the dragon fire is such a powerful energy for transformation and changes in our chemical fire in, in, in symbols in alchemy so um, they have this picture of uh, regularly of dragons sort of sending fire up to a big sort of bowl which is called an alembic, which I liken to the to the Merkaba or our soul, and it's part of that transformative energy. So it's it, again, it's something that was sort of given a negative spin and demonised by by the church when it, um, the patriarchal society took over from the old ways. And mm -hmm. Dragons are also connected with the Mother Earth and the ley lines and that type of thing. But it's all about this energy of transformation. It links back to the violet flame as well. So humanity began through this big time of transformation and change, using those sadnesses and fears and worries as fuel for this fire to bring about big change within ourselves. I had a really big energetic hangover after this energy work, which lasted, uh, has lasted, well, it's probably still going on a little bit. So I still have these weird thoughts and weird um, feelings and not sleeping well. Um, and maybe lots of other people are experiencing those things as well, but like you said, we have this opportunity now to connect with that energy, to connect with those angels or the dragon energies or St. Germain or Lady Portia, who are, again, connected as ascended master presences, to make conscious changes and transformations. 
So yeah. I come back to um, to Jeremiah into the last breath. His his mo is to see people with big burdens, like I said, carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. And his job is to just put his hand on your shoulder and just go, just just take a breath. Just take a minute. Just take a breath. Take a big long breath, and put that down. Mm. You don't need it anymore. And like I said, we said with other things before. Sometimes it's really complex. Sometimes it's really simple. You know, people carry around their wounds, yeah. like you said, like a badge of honor, or it's being better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Or this is my identity. I am a victim. This is the bad things that's happened to me. Yes, they have. But it's your choice to perpetuate those things. Yeah. Sometimes. And it's a hard, it's a hard concept for people to get. But mm. it's the it's the transformational concept yeah, you get. It, you can be a victim to someone. Full stop. You know, if, so, if someone's hurt you, you're a victim to them. But if you keep perpetuating the hurt, then you're a victim to yourself. But the good news on that is, then you can manage yourself out of there. But it's when you when you're stuck in your trauma, and it's generally what happens is we try to deal with our trauma by hitting it with more misconceptions, more self judgment, self blame, shame, all those things that actually hold us still in the trauma. Yeah. And if we feel unsupported and unloved, it's just more layers of you know holding the trauma. And then what we do is we use our that that as a filter to look out to the world and we look for evidence to keep proving we're not good enough, we should be ashamed of ourselves, we, you know, nothing will ever change, whatever story we're telling ourselves. And that creates a barrier to actually, and, and, and there's multiple barriers that we can create, go, you know, generate like resistance, denial, avoidance, codependency mm -hmm. on the identity Absolutely. of what this is creating, yeah. judgment of ourselves, etc. And then, so we make it harder for ourselves, but we don't realise that because we're trying to survive our own emotional reaction to what we're experiencing. And then survival becomes this, once it becomes familiar and we get used to it, we exist in it. Mm -hmm. And then we go, well, I don't want to go into the unknown because this is horrible, but I know at least I know what it is. Or I don't want to experience it spiking up and being, you know, getting the tidal wave of emotions when I've, I've got it so suppressed that it's just every now and then rears its ugly head, but I can keep it down, I can keep it down. So you, your energetic focus becomes on su suppression. Mm. And it, that that's the trap. As yeah. where is if you can go to a healer or a psychologist or whatever works for you, a, a friend, um, and have an honest conversation and really look at the misconceptions, the the fears what's become an identity and mm. start transforming them into sometimes you don't know until you've experienced it. You've got to be prepared to go in that exploration stage of going, well, I'm leaving that. I, I don't know who I am or what I'm doing, but I'll just go and e explore out here. And we mm. we do find our way. Yeah, and there's, there's so much to that, you know, because you too, you, when you're talking about that sort of, that, that world, and we're talking about suppression, some, there's only so much strength that we have as individuals. I mean, we are mm. unbelievably strong, and most of us are uh, a thousand times stronger than we will ever, ever really understand about ourselves. And we have this opportunity and this energy, and it's there. But to suppress those feelings and those emotions, regularly people will turn to unhealthy means for doing that, now, whether that's unhealthy relationships mm. with other people, with sex, with drugs, with alcohol, with food, with f fitness and sport, you know, with with anything risk taking, you know, um, people get Profits. stuck in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, making more money is just a way of keeping score, or um, you know, that those things. It's it's still not it's the suppression. Just like you said, it's all still there. And so, if you you know if you if you like it's like a whack a mole thing, you, you know you can hold so many much of it down, but every now and again, you know, or or like a gopher in Caddyshack, one of these things is going to pop up and not have enough space left to be able to deal with it. Yeah. The other well, thing that's what that's what normally happens. 
yeah. is that it pops up and you've got you've got no more room left. You've 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 you've, you've spent out your energy in in suppressing it. That becomes a gateway and an opportunity if if you're willing to work with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and yeah. yeah. And you you can you can either you just try and push that thing down again and, and ignore it, or you can just go okay, so let's have a conversation about that. Yeah. The other thing you were talking about, um, which which little analogy that I, I want to just to run by you, see what you think is that when people like you said are, are going through that challenge of being a victim and they're looking for telling stories and have sympathetic ears and like minded people, it reminds me of the algorithms on social media where they are constantly checking what you're looking at, checking what you think, checking what your, your comments are, and they will feed you sympathetic stuff. Yeah. You know? So it perpetuates your idea of the world and your idea of reality. And if you feel a certain something or you like a certain something, they'll just feed you more of it. And so what actually happens is that you, you, this is my opinion, this is the world, because everything on social media shows me that I'm right in thinking this. Yeah, and there's a whole and other it narrows, world of things in it. It, it narrows down your thinking. Mm. You, you know what I mean? It, 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 it's it's interesting. Even the I was watching someone select a program to watch, you know, and and it was like, oh, you know, these are more of what you like. And mm. I thought, oh, isn't that funny? Because when we were younger, it was what it was on on TV. Like we <laughs> had two channels, and so, but everyone would talk about the same show because we're all basically watching the same show so you had all these different opinions about different shows that we were watching but it also made you watch things that you probably wouldn't have turned on you know so, so now all of a sudden you you know you're watching a documentary because there's nothing else on about something that you didn't think you were interested and it had you oh i didn't know that so we're losing that stumbling into information that is actually relevant to us or excites us or it, it keeps feeding our curiosity and if we shut down our curiosity then we don't explore we become stuck whereas yeah. if we're if we're and we're curious by nature that's how we've evolved because we were curious to how things work so we're shutting down a natural instinct within us yeah and, and, the, and feeding the oppression yeah and there's that conspiracy theorist that would say well that's what exactly what the greater populace of the CEOs of the big corporations want. They want people to be, you know, quiet and docile and just to watch Saturday night TV and eat pizza and eat the same thing and go to the same place and do the same thing all the time, all day, every day. And then when you just feed them, you just end up being batteries for the Matrix and the Matrix ones. You know? the, yeah. The, 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 the reality that was created yeah. is, is just a safe environment. Everything's lovely. You've got everything you want, everything you need. You don't have to question anything. And I, you know, when I saw that film, and I can't, I can't quite believe that it's nearly twenty-five years old or whatever it is. It makes my eye twitch. Me Showing your really age, old. Karen. Yeah, no. <laughs> but um, I remember watching it, thinking, in my sort of spiritual infancy, thinking that's that's what's happening you know, everywhere. That's what it is. That's what. Yeah. I can, I can remember can, walking yeah. out of the movie theater and going, "I think there's something to that." Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And and it's one of those things. And, and Keanu Reeves himself has said that, that the Matrix films weren't films; they were a documentary about an awakening. Yeah, uh, and and it makes a lot of sense to me. But it's a difficult thing to break out. It's like, you know, how many people do you know that you talk to about the job that they do and they don't like their job or the relationship they're in and they don't really like the relationship that they're in, but they're safe in those things. So yeah. they don't want to change it. Yeah. Um, oh, and we're all guilty of that. We've all, oh, yeah. we've all experienced that where we're, you know, and then you look back and you go, what was I thinking? You know, but, but it is that survival, um, not knowing what direction to head in, you know, like there's all these... There's 101 reasons why we can mm. become stuck. Mm. So it's fascinating, though, isn't it? It's fascinating work to to be involved in, you know, yeah. watching people transform and understanding how the energies work. What do you think humanity needs to acknowledge and, and understand for us to evolve? I think um, there's a great opportunity, like you said, in this tragedy or potential tragedy and it's not potential tragedy because there's tragedy every second of yeah. every day uh, on, on, a, on a 
bigger and bigger scale. Yeah. But we have the opportunity to to regain ownership of our control in our lives and to be able to really, as a collective, if we decided as normal everyday people to change ourselves and change everything else, the things will ripple on. If people did decide, let's take an example of, right, I'm not going to, you know, let's send social media is a great tool. Let's send the information out of social media and say, right, we're not going to do this product anymore with this company. Those companies will panic and fail in, in weeks with the economy the way things are now. Yeah. And that will may lead to the breakdown of societies we know. I believe that our political system is, especially in the UK, is um, too old fashioned to work. Our education systems are too old fashioned to work because people are different now. People believe and absorb information differently. The world is a different place. Uh, but we have the opportunity and the uh, ability to change those things. But it starts with us. And if we can get off those Ferris wheels that we can create for ourselves, or if we can start to heal ourselves of those things and recognize the incredible people and individuals that we are, every single one of us has the ability to do something that will massively change and help somebody else or ourselves. We have abilities to be able to do things and be people that are unique. Nobody else could do the job that we do for somebody else or for ourselves. And be able to do those things and recognize the value of those things. It's a very British thing to say, you know, you, you could single handedly save somebody from a burning building and, you know, and they would go, Oh, thank you so much. You saved my life. You're such a wonderful. And the British person would say, Well, you know, it's just, I'm sorry that I didn't get you shopping as well. I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'll go back. In, I'll go back in and get it. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it is honouring that uniqueness and valuing that we are all unique. Yeah. And that that compassion for one another actually feeds our soul. Mm. You know, like it, it really well, feeds our soul. I, I I love helping people. I love nothing more than asking somebody how they're doing. Mm. Uh, and they say, and again, the British response is, "Oh, I'm fine, thank you." Mm. And they could be on fire sitting next to you. And you go, are you okay? Like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> are you sure? Yeah. Well, yes, yes, I am. And I was, you have to ask three times. Okay? Yeah, right. And we did this, interesting, I did this when I did some um, mental health first aid training. That's one of the things they say, is when you say to somebody, are you all right? They go, oh, yes, yes, yes. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? Because you don't, you know, you look like you could, you're having a hard time. Yeah, and it's that three times, and when you say those things three times, you're actually saying to this person, "I'm really invested in what you have to say. I'm not just asking for the sake of asking. I am. I have something. If you want to sit down and talk, let's talk. Yeah, it's not just a hey, doing all right. See you. Bye. Yeah. It's that time and energy, and it makes. Actually, a I had huge a client difference. yesterday, and she actually said, when she was leaving, she said, "People don't spend time with us." with each other anymore we're so busy that we don't have those solid friendships where we just sit and talk and mm. we just you know offload and and I was uh, you know I feel privileged because I still I still do have that and 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 she and she said it it would it, it, it would be she said I would find it a privilege to still have that because all you know everyone's got too busy and they've all you know, they've just all sort of drifted away because they're all busy. And I thought, oh, we're losing so much in these little things, you know, yeah. like spend time with people and really and hear their stories, listen to them. So, and it's, if someone's listening to you, don't use it as a dump, but use it yeah. as a an exploration, you know, like, I don't know why I think this, you know, and, and you know, explore what you're experiencing more so than just dumping it and moving on to the next person and dumping it and moving on to the next person. So, yeah, yeah. it is absolutely yeah. that. Because, and also social media is, is that dump. That's what people are so used to doing. You know, this is my lunch, dump the picture. This is my tea, dump the picture. This yeah. is what I'm wearing, this is how I'm dump, 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 dump. And uh, so many people now, and, and I, but I do believe it has got worse, and I know that that's just what old people say, and I, I class myself in the, in the middle-aged people now. Oh, careful, Kieran. <laughs> we're similar age <laughs> yeah I know but 
um, I'm just, it's just one of those things that I go, people, people still, when I was a kid, rarely would you listen to somebody and actually listen to what they have to say. Lots yeah. of people now listen to something, but they're just waiting for an opportunity to put forward their opinion. Or they're yes. not really listening to what somebody's actually saying, the subtext to what they're saying underneath it. Um, it's just an opportunity to comment. And this is my thing about social media as well, is that just because everyone has an opportunity now to comment on anything and everything that everyone says or does, doesn't mean that they should. Mm. Just because you can say something about somebody, there's an anonymity behind the screen and your usernames, doesn't mean that you should. Doesn't yeah. mean that you should, you know, somebody puts a picture up going, look at me. And it doesn't mean that you should say anything yeah. or do anything, you know. Yeah. Because it can be very damaging to those people if you say choose to say something negative, and it's easy to say something negative. That's it's right. It's a cheap shot. It is a cheap shot. And when you're having – that's why the podcast is done in conversation style, more so than just directing questions. Mm. You know, I mean, you still ask questions, but in a, in a conversation style because it's an exchange of ideas. You know, it's an exchange of – what are you exploring? What are you looking at? Mm. And and it's like, oh, I you know, I, I don't know much about gateways and dragon energy and, and you know, so he's someone that's actually experiencing that. What what are they experiencing? And that's that's a conversation where you're you're listening and exchanging ideas respectfully. Mm. Not just throwing Absolutely. judgment. Yeah. If you don't understand something, ask them. Yeah. And they'll, they'll explain it to you. It's, their their understanding of it, they'll explain to you. The other, so. there's another thing which I, I really found jarring, and and it's come up with with people as well. People saying just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean I hate you. Yeah, yeah. You know? And this yeah. is the thing. It's one of those phrases as well. Haters gonna hate and all this sort of thing. I may not agree with with something that somebody has to say about their opinions on 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 any topic. Yeah. But you're allowed to, you're allowed to disagree with people and still love them you don't have to just group people and still like them you don't even have to like them yeah. but i don't think you have to hate them if you well, we can agree to, to disagree yeah yeah, yeah. and we you can know. just go right I'm, I, you see the world in a different way when I mean, the conversations um, you and i have are awesome because what what i what i really love and one of my favorite stories is, is used to work with somebody who's a very deep rooted christian we have very on the surface of things, very polar opposite views of the world, old school ways, New Testament ways. But when we spoke and we talked about it, it comes down to the fundamentals as are the same. Yes. Be good to people. Be good yes. to yourself. Listen to people. Look after your friends. Look after the community. Look after the planet. And don't be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and. and, and, that's, and, and well, I'm asking everybody the question about humanity, and there's becoming a very big theme that most of us orientate to, and it's compassion. So we're talking about compassion. Um, next year, the energy, um, the, the overriding presence for next year is Kuan Yin. She is all about compassion. Everything, the all essence of her being is compassion, 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 compassion. And she is seen riding a dragon. Uh her energy will start to come in on the 1st of November, because that's the old shift of the old year uh, around sewing. And then so that compassion and understanding will hopefully start to flow from the, the sort of autumn time in, in, in the UK uh, into next year. We all look forward to that very much indeed. And hopefully the sooner the better. If she starts sprinkling some compassion now would be, would be very good. <laughs> Thank you. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been lovely to uh, to spend some time with you. Thanks very much.